And then um, I'll just give my little spiel that I always use to, to start up MXG um, for folks who might be new. Um, so Maine Accelerates Growth is a statewide network of organizations and individuals that support entrepreneurs and innovators to scale in Maine and beyond. We believe that a vibrant, inclusive innovation and entrepreneurial ecosystem will result in a more abundant, equitable, and sustainable economy and make Maine a great place to live, work, and play. We work together to share expertise, seek best practices, and to address system gaps. We promote the successes of Maine startups and entrepreneur support organizations and collaborate to attract talent and inspire innovation. Um, so we have a great agenda uh, this month. Um, generally to start, I just like to create a little space for anybody who might be new to the group to just do a very quick introduction, just uh, name, organization, maybe where in Maine you're based. Um, and then we'll, we'll go into kind of updates from the group. Um, so anybody who's new, feel free to just kind of raise your hand or if you haven't been here in like a year or so, um, feel free to just raise a hand and I'll, I'll call you up. And that can include, I know we have a few presenters here, so you can just give a very quick introduction now and then you'll do a, a, a longer one. Go ahead, Amanda. Hey everybody, I'm Amanda Smith. I am a Coastal Opportunities Advisor with Sunrise County Economic Council. And I work primarily with our working waterfront folks in helping them to identify ways to diversify their business interests here in Washington County. Great, thanks so much, Amanda, welcome. Uh, Jen, I saw your hand up. Hi, uh, Jen Lundero from Coffee Hound Coffee Company. We're based out of Bangor region. I am one of the speakers today, so I'm looking forward to it. Thank you for having me today. Thanks, Jen. Uh, go ahead, Ken. Hey, I'm Ken Shapiro, the co-founder of Apricot, and I'll also be presenting quickly today. Nice to meet you all. Thanks, Ken. Uh, go ahead, Shivi. Hey, everybody. I'm Shivi Singh, founder and CEO of Legacy. I'll be presenting today, so excited to... Um, to kind of learn about what everyone else is doing. Great, go ahead, Arabi. Hi, I'm Arabi Balasubramanian, founder and CEO of Emtech Care Labs. We are Portland-based and I'm also presenting today. Thank you. Great, and welcome to everybody who just joined. Um, anybody else who wanted to introduce themselves? It looks like I'm, I'm mostly seeing familiar faces. All right. Um, well, I'm going to just kick us off with a few updates from MTI, and then we'll um, Jake's going to give a few updates from DCD, and then we'll we'll get into the uh, presentations. Um, so we actually have a few different MTI updates uh, this month. So the first is MTI is actually moving. Um, well, to the extent that we have a current location. So for folks um, might be aware that MTI is an office in Brunswick at um, the Brunswick Landing near Tech Place. That building is on the market. Um, and MTI has also moved to a pretty distributed workforce model since the, the start of COVID. So most of us work from home. Um, and we have folks ranging from Bangor to, to York County. Um, so since that building is on the market, MTI has decided to really commit to the distributed model. So we're not going to have a, a permanent office anymore, but we are going to be uh, renting a few office spaces at the new Cloudport location in Portland. Um, folks might be aware that Cloudport's expanding into a second location. So MTI is going to have a, a kind of a mini headquarters there. Um, but just to, to make folks aware that we're no longer going to have that, that Brunswick location. Um, my second update is that Joe Migliaccio, who a lot of you are probably familiar with, he's he's been at MTI since uh, 2000, um, is decided to retire, uh, very well earned, having spent almost 25 years at MTI. Um, so he'll be leaving us uh, at the end of July. Um, so definitely, if you know him personally, feel free to drop him a line and just congratulate him on his retirement. Um, he's been such an asset to MTI over the years. He's really grown with us. Um, he he briefly served as interim president um, and has just held a number of roles and just been really vital to, to MTI um, and, and our kind of role in the ecosystem. Um, we've had a couple staffing additions. Um, so we had a new staff accountant uh, join. That, her name's Rhea Ryder. Um, and then we're also hosting a Innovate for Maine fellow, an intern, uh, Jackson Quinn from Bates College, and he'll be working with us all summer. Um, and then my last update, and this is probably the one that folks are most interested in, is that um, MTI is going to be launching another version of our Prime program. Um, so folks might uh, be aware of the previous Prime programs we launched, but basically those are funds that came to MTI through the um, uh, American Rescue Plan Act um, that came out of COVID. Um, they came to the state of Maine and then the state of Maine asked us to distribute them. So we're going to be launching, we have 7 million left of that, those funds, and we're going to be putting them out um, through in the form of grants uh, through a competitive process that will open up in July. Um, this particular round uh, is gonna have a, a focus on um, serving companies that might be new to MTI, so haven't received prior MTI funding, um, as well as companies that are led by underserved entrepreneurs or um, underserved regions within the state. 
Um, and in terms of kind of how the applications are going to be scored, um, it'll be a, a 40 point scoring rubric. Um, and that'll be uh, based on 10 points for quality and amount of matching funds, uh, 10 points for depth and quality of the leadership team, 20 points if new to MTI, uh, 20 points if the company is located in rural Maine and or led by an underserved founding team. Uh, and requests of up to 250,000 will be considered. Uh, and award decisions are expected to be made in September. Um, so keep an eye out for more information on that. Um, and I'll definitely you know, post uh, information in the notes document that goes out after this meeting, but just wanted to put that on folks' radar as I imagine a lot of companies are gonna be interested in utilizing that. So that's all I have. Um, so I'll turn it over to Jake. Some great updates. Uh, congrats to Joe, that's cool. Um, I only have one update and I just wanted to, to talk about the business recovery and resilience fund. Um, this is for businesses affected by the severe weather event events, um, specifically the January 10th and 13th storm and the December 18th storm. Uh, I've been getting a lot of questions about whether the April disaster declaration storm is in and it is not. Um, you don't have to have been in a disaster declaration county to be able to apply. Um, so it is somewhat open, but those applications are due on the 25th. So we've only got five days left. Um, and I'm really encouraging people to apply by this weekend. It's an online portal application. You can't save your work. Um, so you need to do it in one, one swoop. Um, so I'd rather people be starting that process now in case they need technical assistance or whatnot. Um, so if anybody has questions about that, feel free to email me, call me. Um, I can get you guys set up, but let me know. That's it for me, Tom. Excellent. Thanks, Jake. Any any questions for Jake on that? Don't think I see any. Okay, great. Then um, we'll turn it over to our first presenter, uh, which is Apricot. So Ken, uh, go ahead. And so I'll put a little timer up on my screen. Um, you'll have roughly five minutes. Though we're a little ahead of schedule. So if you take six or seven, that's fine. Um, and then we'll have about five minutes for, um, for uh, Q&A if folks have questions. Great. Thanks, Tom. And um... It's so nice to see some of you and to meet many of you. Um, as I said at the top, um, from Apricot, we are I'm sitting here at actually right across the hall from Araby, who you see on your screen there as well. We're both um, the in the initial cohort at Northeastern University's Rue Institute Founder of Healthcare Residency. So we're in residence here at Northeastern University. Um, my company, Apricot, and while I'm in a Founders of Healthcare residency, we're not really a healthcare company. We really are more of a public health company. And our mission is to improve the health and wellness of communities by bringing data to life. And the way that we're doing that is we're um, building models of communities that are informed by lots of large public data sets. Um, and we're making them usable and, and analyzable for local public health officials to actually bring the data together into one platform. Um, disaggregate it and understand what's happening inside of their own communities. That's sort of the one of the, the tenets of public health is understanding what's happening across your population, doing that assessment and um, designing and implementing uh, interventions to improve the health of a population. There are 3,300 public health entities, local health jurisdictions in the United States of America, and the vast majority of them do not have the capacity to bring these data together and to really get an understanding of what's happening inside of their own communities, as many of you probably saw evidence of throughout the, uh, the COVID epidemic. Um, we, um, we're about a year old now. Um, we are, have taken massive advantage of the resources in the state of Maine to help small companies to get started. Um, in addition to um, starting here at the Rue, we, were, we came in with a concept or an idea um, that was conceived of immediately before the applications were due. Um, and since that time, we have managed to take advantage of a lot of the resources. We're, um, finish, we just finished up a range two MTI grant and we're about to apply for a range three. Um, we hired two co-ops from the Northeastern University, and that was subsidized by the Alphon Family Foundation, which made it possible for us to bring employees on much earlier than we otherwise would have been able to. Um, one of those co-ops, is a, she's a Mainer. She's doing a master's degree, and she's her education is being subsidized by the Alphon Family Foundation. Um, and, and the resources go on and on with the support we've gotten to, to start our small company here in Maine. 
Um, we have been largely focused on generating uh, initial revenue so that we can have use cases in the real world to show what we're doing. What we're doing is is it's a very complex uh, statistical approach to to performing public health, a field that's not accustomed to rapid uh, technological adoption. Um, so we thought it was really important that we get use cases in place, and we. Um, we're happy to report in the last few months, we uh, have come under contract with Maine Health Community uh, Health Team in support of their work on food security um, in partnership with the City of Portland Public Health. And we're building a model of York and Cumberland County with them now to develop better estimates of food insecurity and to help them figure out um, where they should be putting their um, food security, their, their uh, their food support resources across York and Cumberland County. And some of you may have seen that Senator Angus King included an earmark in the most recent appropriations bill for a mobile food pantry. So we'll be helping them to figure out where that should be going and why. We also have a contract in California with the investor owned utilities to produce estimates of persons with particular health conditions that require the use of electricity. Um, to help them figure out um, who should be enrolling in a program they have if you require life-sustaining equipment because of a condition or a device that you need. Um, you can enroll in a program where you get reduced electricity rates. So we're, we're building a model of the state of California at the moment. And then lastly, um, in support of the main CDC, they are in receipt of a large uh, federal CDC grant to build a surveillance and detection system for Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. And they're in year one of that grant and we're building the foundation of a surveillance and detection system um, for the state of Maine so they can start to do a better job of understanding where Alzheimer's disease and related dementia is happening and where it's not being caught and um, where to start to put resources to address this, this huge societal problem that we have. Um, which is pronounced in Maine, given the, the makeup of the population. Those are our uh, three big projects at the moment, and I've reached the limits of my time, and I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. The last thing I want to say is um, it, it also in celebration of our first year anniversary, we're we're going to gather at Gritty's in the old, old port today from four to seven and just invite anyone who in any way has helped us to make it through this first year. Um, and you are an entrepreneurial support network. So please, all of you are welcome to swing by and, and say hi and meet some others who've also helped us to, to get to where we've gotten this first year. That's a great ease from four to seven today. Thanks, Tom. Oop, I'm muted. Uh, that's great. Thanks so much, Ken. Um, any, any questions? I'll, I'll kick us off. Oh, oh, oh uh, go ahead. I, I think I heard somebody. Well, go ahead, Marty. That's okay, Tom. You, you, you go ahead. You, oh, I was going to ask Ken how he got started in all this. What's his background? Oh, uh, yeah. So my background is I spent 20 years as a, uh, a government official. I was in the White House as an analyst, focusing really on uh, drug policy for about eight years. And then after the passage of the Affordable Care Act, I joined Federal Health and Human Services out West and was um, largely responsible for trying to have a smooth implementation of the Affordable Care Act in the Western United States. Um, and then I joined my county health department in 2017 in California, Marin County, and was um, I led their homeless response efforts there for a few years. And then um, the last few years I was in California, immediately before the um, before COVID arrived, I became the deputy director for health and human services for my health department in California. Um, and then I moved to Maine and found out about um, the re -res residency and um, pretty much my professional career since I arrived in Maine has been um, making a go of, of apricot. Oh, thank you. Is there any particular uh, uh, name or uh, story behind the, the name for the business? My question too, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a there's a whole bunch of reasons we're called apricot or apricot, and either we we are happy with either pronunciation. Just to be really clear, there is there's a whole bunch of reasons why we're called apricot, and we have the explanation on our website. Um, but it comes down to some of the mathematics of what we're doing. One of the methods we're using to bring um, different data sets together 
and come up with estimates, we have to sort of smooth out the estimates. And that method is called kerneling, which is the center of an apricot. Um, and then the health of a population over time is P to the QOT. So we had that, and then we thought about calling ourselves Applied Population Research, APR, but that's really boring. But if you put those two together, you get apricot. Um, so that's why we're called apricot. And it's a uh, it makes branding really easy because apricots have a color. So we just roll with that color. Great, awesome, thanks. Uh, uh, other questions for Ken? Yeah, I'll hop in. Um, what can we do as a group to support you guys now? Um, well, I, I mean, it's a hard question because we feel incredibly supported by the main community. I, um, I, don't, I don't have a good answer for that. You could come to Grady's and meet some other people. I find that a lot of what we've got done over this past year has been personal relationships. We knew that you know, there were any number of directions we could go with what we were doing. And we made a conscious decision to focus as locally as possible and build um, goodwill and trust inside of Maine. And I think it's evidenced by the fact that we're doing a project for the state. We're doing a project for Maine Health. We're doing a project for the city of Portland. And we'd love to um, keep that rolling and keep that goodwill going. And we think the more value we can show to stakeholders in Maine, um, the, the better off we will be. We think it's a perfect launching pad. We also are not naive. We don't think we can make a, a long-term go of it serving main, main based entities. Um, but we think it's a perfect place to start for a number of reasons. There's openness to what we're doing. We're here. We have credibility. There are serious demographic challenges that Maine is facing, as you all are very well aware. Um, and there's also a, um, there's a, sort of hollowed out public health infrastructure in Maine to just be completely blunt. Um, and it's growing back back up, but um, a lot of people practicing and committed to public health in Maine, they, they still need help. And um, those all are opportunities for us. So, I mean, that's as specific as I can get, but we feel, we feel deep support from the community already. Ken, is there any other data set? Any who else would have a data set besides? Is it like the main public health association, or or mm. even if you thought nationally, like what would be the ideal place yeah. for you to put your tool to work? Yeah, so that's a fantastic question, and it really comes down to as we're engaging with partners, that's how we gain access to data. Um, we can't go out as a corporation and just get our hands on data and, and build models. So it's really going to be in partnership. So that's a, there's something called the Maine Health Data Organization that have data sitting there. And that's something we're working on with the state CDC right now is to get a data use agreement together so we can start to bring real world claims data into our model of Alzheimer's disease. That's, I think that's the data set we're most interested in getting our hands on um, that sits out there widely and broadly. And then our vision, which is shared with Maine Health, is um, as we proceed on the work we're doing on food insecurity, that we'll start to bring real world data from their electronic health record into our system. Um, that's probably a good four to six months out from the initial work that we're doing to engage the stakeholders in the community and figure out what variables are of most interest to them. Um, but th those are the data sets we want are real world data to inform um, the population models that we build and the estimates of health that are uh, part of what we call our base model. So it really is, it's, um, it's engagement by engagement using their data to bring it into the overall population model to best inform them. It's really, th those are the data sets that are going to matter most to us. Well, awesome. The Thank other you so one much, is that oh, we, we're also, I'm sorry, there's one other data set in Maine that is unique and we are salivating to get our hands on it. It's the Maine Integrated Youth Health Survey. Um, Maine does something very unusual. There's something called the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, which is a national survey that gets representative samples from 8th through 12th graders. Um, New York City, for example, asks 13,000 kids this, these questions and then they come up with estimates. Maine makes this survey available to every child in public school from seventh through 12th grade. So it's much more akin to a surveillance system. 
And there's not a lot of hay made out of that data set. And we're talking right now to, um, to some funders about um, pulling that data together and making that usable to school districts com and communities to rather than the data sitting there in the state and PDF reports going to a school district once a year, us turning it into a living, breathing surveillance system where you can benchmark and really understand what's happening inside of your community. So that's my real answer to your question is that we'd love to get the main integrated youth health survey into our model. Awesome, Great. thanks uh, Thanks so much, Ken. Uh, do you mind um, when you get a moment just dropping your email in the, in the chat and that way if folks have follow-up questions, they can just shoot you a message. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, next presenter is Legacy. So I'm going to turn it over to Shivi. Amazing. Hi, everybody. Um, I have a presentation ready. So is it okay if I share that? Yep. You should have you should have share permissions. Amazing. Um, so I'll go ahead and share this. All right. Um, and I'll go ahead and present that full screen. Um. All right, cool. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, first, can everybody see the... Okay, great. Um, yep, looks good. Awesome. Um, so I am the uh, founder of Legacy. So a little bit about myself, my background first before we hop into this. My background is actually in software development and uh, and machine learning. So I'm coming in from a very technical background, some really hot stuff right now with AI and all that. Um, but I realized that I wanted to take that technical background and apply it to a space that I thought was both severely underserved, but also ripe for innovation. Um, that in addition to my own personal experiences with my own um, you know, family members and loved ones, uh, kind of brought me into the space of advanced care planning. So for those who don't know, advanced care planning is the process through which patient values can go into their care. It can be as clinical as questions like, do you want to be resuscitated? But more often and more effectively, they are more holistic questions. So things like, what does your ideal day look like? What is your relationship with your independence, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason advanced care planning is important is because it allows us to create goal concordant care and uh, beneficial interventions that actually help the population. Right now, 40% of interventions are actually non-beneficial. And that means that we're providing so much of our healthcare um, in ways that is not helpful. And that's what we want to tackle. So here at Legacy, you know, it's like I mentioned, advanced care planning is super effective, but it is severely underutilized. Um, we can see that the average cost savings per customer or about um, per patient is about twenty thousand um, dollars. The reduction in care costs is higher than thirty five percent. So we're talking talking over a third of a reduction in care costs um, when advanced care planning is applied. However, um, the reason that it's not being used is that one, it's extremely time uh, intensive and clinicians do not have the time to do this. Two, um, it's really hard to scale because it's very fragmented the way that the data works. So oftentimes um, patients will be in a situation where this conversation will happen so late into their patient journey, often at end of life, that they have to repeat this conversation over and over and over again, totaling over six hours of conversations with at least seven to 12 different uh, clinicians. And because all that data is fragmented, that means that we can actually never get a holistic look for the clinical care team of who this patient is and, and what they value and, and the best way to provide this goal concordant care. So the current patient and clinician journey is as you can see, we're starting treatment, hospitalization, late stage happens, and that's when these conversations happen. Um, like I said, that this is going through with multiple clinicians uh, and multiple ACP conversations that are, again, never brought into the care that the patient then receives. Um, we come in and we actually streamline advanced care planning throughout the whole patient journey by integrating into clinical workflows and the patient care data. What that means is that we actually offer a personalized way for care planning that we can actually integrate into the EMR systems and that we are completely integrated in clinical workflows. So clinicians do not have to leave their EHR system to have an insight into what their patients are uh, and what the patients value and what their families value, et cetera. Um, the patient and clinician journey with Legacy looks something like this, where Legacy is there at every single touch point. And these conversations are happening throughout so that the care that we provide to these patients is actually concordant with what they value. Um, and why is this important? Well, we have this concerted movement into value-based care in the health system 
Um, and we can see that where even in main care, 40% of beneficiaries are supposed to be on uh, are on value-based care right, contracts right now. And the CMS is actually aiming to have all Medicare beneficiaries on value-based contracts by 2030. So there's this huge push and value-based care means more patient-centric care. How can we get the patient's care that they actually need and interventions that are beneficial to them? There's also the big silver tsunami into healthcare, um, which means that more and more folks will actually be having in a place to make these decisions. And 83% of patients actually prefer quality of life over these non-beneficial clinical uh, interventions. So the only way to get that and make that a reality is by ensuring that we have the advanced care plan in place. In addition, consistently increasing cost of care, whether that's with, you know, seen in the lack of uh, clinicians available, seen in the literal cost of care, um, means that it is more and more important for health systems, payers, and patients alike to get care that is actually helpful. Um, yeah. And so we're here to push for more patient valued uh, and centric care. And as you can see, these are some of the metrics of just kind of how important and how expensive currently our care is for these non-beneficial uh, interventions. Yeah, so thank you. Um, what we're looking for right now is any type of uh, kind of insight that you have on how we can partner with health systems, private clinics, uh, providers, who uh, who would enjoy something like this and see that it is important to provide uh, goal concordant care for their patients. Awesome, thanks so much. I saw I saw you on a slide right before this one on traction. I, I'd love to hear just a little bit about kind of where you are as a, as a business at the moment. Sure. So right now we're actually building um, our V1. So we're post MVP building our V1 and we're working with Maine Health and Northern Light to actually uh, to actually create these. So. This is really great because we get to understand two different health systems very deeply and get to generify our original MVP to fit into what it is that they need as we hone in on our ICP and and the uh, exact kind of product benefits that we're we're creating. Awesome, thank you. Um, other other questions. Is the best what? email oh, for ahead. you, Shibby? Mm -hmm. Get legacy app at gmail.com. Um, I can send this. Um, I'm gonna just I sent it in the chat. Shibby at legacy the app is the best way to get in touch with me. Um Perfect. yeah. Tom, I, this is Joe. I have a quick question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh Shibby, how how do you um do you get incorporated into the the health and insurance reimbursement market, like you have a code for this and okay, awesome. And now I'm gonna imagine one of the benefits you said was it allows the providers, customers to demonstrate that they're improving outcomes and collect their reimbursements and stuff. So is that? Yeah, and that's exactly so. Two sides to that. So advanced care planning actually straddles both fee-for-service and value-based care. Um, in the fee-for-service world, there's actually two codes that uh, can be leveraged for advanced care planning. Um, these codes are severely underutilized. They are utilized at less than 3% of the time. And they bring in um, about $75 uh, dollars for every subsequent conversation and $86 for the first. So that means that in an hour and a half, you can actually make, oh, well, 45 minutes to an hour and a half, you can actually bring in reimbursement of $235 per patient. And that's one of the things that we're offering to health systems, which is we can do this for you without you lifting a finger and you can get your reimbursement. So um, it ends up being a little bit compelling on the fee-for-service side. On the value-based side, there's even the deeper measurements of or the metrics used to determine um, you know, patient outcomes, patient care, um, clinician uh, ability to actually understand patient, all those other metrics are uh, are affected as well. Thank you. Have you met Sensio Systems yet? No. Okay, Tom and I will connect and I can make an introduction. They might be a, a nice uh, mentor for you. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I'll ask my same one, I guess. She, she, who, who's the right, I'm looking at your website. Are you, are you trying to reach like practice groups? Who, who Who's the right customer for you to be in front of? Yeah, I mean, we're really right now, I guess when I, I was a little naive when I got into this space because I thought 
there's big hospitals and there's small hospitals, right? Um, and that is just not it. There's so much in between. So we're still trying to really hone in on what is that ideal customer profile. So yeah, we are starting to un in enter into like the ACO space. So anyone who's who might be like the general or the head of a, a, uh, an accountable care organization, small private practices with one to five um uh, one to five clinicians and as well as small to mid-sized health systems. So that's on the health system side, on insurer side, looking for small um, insurers. So that's kind of what the goals are right now. Interesting. I mean, I work at a law firm. We have trust in the state's lawyers. I think mm -hmm. we also want that conversation. <laughs> I don't know what help it would be, but yeah, it's got to be I think Joe is right. I mean, there's a lot of people trying to reach that group. So interesting to think and brainstorm about. Yeah, absolutely. And we've actually talked to um, trust and estate lawyers and, and estate planning uh, firms as well. And this is something that they love. Like they think this is fantastic because they do, they're the first step for people who can afford to do trust um, planning. And they include advanced care planning in there. But the problem is that that never goes back into the medical um, establishment, right? And if you expect a doctor when the time happens to go and call your lawyer and it's, you know, after 5 p.m. on a weekday, before 9 a.m. on a weekday or, or it's a weekend, no one's going to get that information. And so that's where the medical establishment very much believes that ACP is a medical intervention and we're kind of bringing it back into the medical side so that even if lawyers offer this, that they can be assured that this information is actually going to be used. Awesome. Well, I think that takes us to time. So thanks so much, Shivy. I really appreciate it. And you Thank already you. posted your, uh, your uh, email in the chat if anybody has follow-up questions. Thank you. All right. So um, I realized that we have a bit of a health-focused uh, MXG this this uh, week. So we'll move on to our, our next one, which is MTech Care Labs. Great. Um... Yeah, uh, let me just share my screen as well. I have a brief presentation. Um, all right. Are you guys able to see my screen? Yes, it's not in slideshow mode at the moment. Oh, no, it is. Yep, looks great. How about now? Are you able to see? Yep. It? Okay, yep, right. looks good. Awesome. Hi, everyone. I'm R.I.B. Balasubramanian. I'm the founder and CEO of MTech Care Labs. As Ken and Shivi were mentioning, um, I'm also one of the founders in the Future of Healthcare Founder Residency Program at the Wu Institute. Um, and uh, we, were part, we were part of the cohort from last year. Um, uh, essentially, uh, what we focus on is uh, family care management for uh, dementia care. Um, our mission is to really support family caregivers in providing the best care at home for older adults. Um, and for this, we have a platform called um, Care Wallet. It's a digital platform through which family caregivers can collaboratively navigate all aspects of care at home for an older adult with conditions like Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, um, um, I'm originally from India. I started, I founded this company mostly due to my own personal experiences providing care for my parents. Um, and when I was navigating all of this care experience, it was very clear to me as a family member, you're playing a very vital role, uh, especially when there is a complex care need like dementia in how that patient's well-being and, and overall health care is being administered, especially over a long period of time as well. And that's what prompted me to found this company, especially given the complexities of navigating healthcare here in the US. Uh, it was a much needed uh, space that I personally have had experience with. And as I started forming my own team, um, all of the team members that uh, were involved in uh, MTech Care Labs currently have some personal experience with Alzheimer's and dementia care. Um, Right now, it's myself uh, as a CEO of the company. My background is in management consulting, uh, particularly corporate strategy and M&A, um, helping companies in healthcare um, launch new products, enter new markets, and grow at scale. Uh, my partner in crime uh, was Ivan. Um, he's also my husband. 
um, and he's originally from Spain, and he's also experiencing a similar fair caregiving situation with his parents. Uh, both of us are relatively new to Maine. We were actually based in Massachusetts until maybe about two years ago. Um, and one thing I would say, moving to Maine, has uh, it's been very much a welcoming experience for us over the past couple of years, uh, not only from a personal perspective, but also from a professional perspective. And uh, we're really impressed at how close-knit the community here is in Maine is. Um, in addition to the two of us, uh, we also have a team of advisors uh, really cutting across a couple of different ex um, expertise, um, every, everyone from um, um, nursing background to um, care management background to dementia-specific caregiving background to really help us guide as we develop this platform. Um, why specifically dementia? Um, this is one area that is often fraught with a lot of conflict in many ways, uh, both emotional conflict as well as mental conflict among family members. Uh, but the reality is uh, today there are close to 7 million Americans who are dealing with dementia or some form of dementia and often rely heavily on family members for the care. Um, most dementia patients have at least three to four uh, chronic conditions that the family member is helping care for. Um, in addition, they're also experiencing very frequent uh, transitions of care, whether it be uh, care in a hospital setting or a facility-based care setting or even home-based care setting. And all of this often um, really rests on the family caregiver. Um, so this is this is a problem that we are seeing not only with the family members, but often the, the problem also dominoes into the cost equation for the uh, health systems. Um, today, a patient with dementia um, costs the health plans or the health systems three times as much as a patient without dementia. Um, so having a more structured and coordinated approach around care at home, uh, particularly supporting family caregivers, is a much uh, needed um, support. Um, and our solution, as I mentioned, is Care Wallet. It's a digital platform. Currently, it's a web-based app. Uh, we will be launching a companion mobile app soon as well, uh, which is meant for family members to collaboratively manage um, all the key aspects of dementia care at home. Uh, it is a fairly comprehensive system in that we look at everything from care planning all the way through ongoing care management in a home setting. And we also look at it more comprehensively from the perspective of not just the, the aspects of healthcare, but also how do you manage the, the healthcare benefits as well as um, uh, paying for care in many cases, because um, as you may know, many family members um, often pool in money uh, to pay for such care on behalf of the patient. So this is really an integrated platform that brings uh, transparency to care and also gives a very consistent approach to providing this care in a guided and supported manner. Um, and again, at, at, at its core, um, Care Wallet is really meant to be a person-centered care uh, platform. Um, and we are able to accomplish this through a combination of uh, patient as well as caregiver data, along with machine learning algorithms um, and API technologies to provide a very personalized care plan that the family members can uh, manage at home on an ongoing basis, um, in addition to getting virtual care management support through our expert, uh, expert network of care managers. Um, in terms of where we are, um, earlier this year, we launched a beta version of the platform in Maine. Uh, currently, we are testing the platform in Massachusetts and Maine. Um, essentially, what that means is the patient has to be a resident of Maine and Mass or Massachusetts, uh, but the caregivers can be located anywhere. Um, so far, we have been able to collect some good feedback from our initial testers, and we are relaunching our platform end of next week, uh, end of June. Uh, this is a platform that now has HIPAA compliance and is also capable of uh, addressing care planning more comprehensively with the support of care managers. Um, a big thanks to the MTI funding, uh, which went a long way in helping us get to this stage in relaunching this platform. Um, looking ahead, our goal is to really uh, start forming the partnerships that we need to have in place, particularly with health systems. Uh, we are exploring these with Northern Light Health and Maine Health. Uh, we already have two partnerships in place today, which is with uh, Southern Maine Aging Agency, as well as Cedars Portland, to continue testing our platform with caregivers and dementia patients. 
And as we look ahead, our goal is to really um, invest or, or continue to invest in the uh, product development and start serving our users with an eye towards revenue generation this year. Uh, so at this stage, we are pre-revenue. Uh, from a commercialization standpoint, we are really looking at health plans. Uh, this is a subscription service at the moment, uh, but ultimately the uh, customer for us is really going to be health plans, whether it be Medi Medicare Advantage or possibly Medicaid. Those are the areas that we are evaluating at the moment. Great, thanks, Arby. Um, so uh, we that went a little over, which is totally fine. It's just we should probably keep the Q and A um, fairly succinct. So maybe just one or two questions. So um, anybody, anybody with um, questions for Arby? I don't know how succinct this question is, but I was glad to see you're working with the Cedars. That's what came to mind. You know, an assisted living facility. So are, are you getting some helpful feedback from them? Uh, so this, we've been demoing the platform with our partners. So we've been getting feedback from them. The users of the platform are going to be the family caregivers. So this is really geared towards independent living communities, uh, not as much assisted living facilities. Um, and so far during our testing, we've been collecting feedback from um, family caregivers themselves. Got it. Thank you. So, RB, I think uh, Joe's uh, introduction a little bit ago to Sensio Systems might be a good one for you if you don't know those folks as well. Um, yeah, connected with Piali. Oh, great. She, she's fabulous. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, just in the interest of time, I think we should probably cut questions there. But RB, if you want to put your um, email in the chat, and then if folks have more questions, they can follow up directly. And thank you so much for presenting. All right, um, so we'll move on to our last presenter for today, which is Coffee Hound. So Jen, take it away. Hi, thank you guys today. Um, and sorry to follow up and not be health oriented, but there was <laughs> a Washington Post article that coffee is equal to a portion of uh, broccoli and really helps with uh, type two diabetes. So there you go, <laughs> here's my health plug. Um, I'm president of Coffee Hound Coffee Company, and we just rounded our 11th year of operation. We're veteran founded and certified women owned. We're also a main, main brand and dedicated to craftsmanship. Uh, we're ethically sourcing our coffee from small farms all around the world and small batches right in the heart of Maine. So we're in Brewer, Bangor region. Uh, we've been participants of a lot of the Maine Center for Entrepreneur programs. There's a little plug for Lori because she's on here. Uh, so we were in Top Gun, Food and Beverage Accelerator recently with Upstart Scratchpad Group. Um, and now we're a mentor with MCE as well. So I'm really excited to be able to give back. Uh, we produce about 100,000 pounds of coffee every year at our roasting facility. and But we don't just understand roasting coffee. Uh, we understand consumers through the cafes because that's where we started in the coffee industry in 2013. You either start roasting and then have cafes or have cafes and then start roasting. Uh, we launched our first cafe in Bar Harbor in 2013 and have now successfully converted all of our cafe locations to licensed locations like a franchise, but not a franchise. Um, the the first one was in uh, Sunday River Ski Resort. So we have two locations, two licensed locations at Sunday River Ski Resort and one in Bar Harbor. And this shows our ability to be able to successfully collaborate, whether it's with a small business or a large corporation. We focus in a few different um, profit centers, wholesale coffee, which also includes our private label, uh, which has led to a lot of our collaborations. E-commerce, of course, um, cold brew coffee with ready to drink cans of coffee and kegs of coffee. And also as a one-stop shop for cafes, either with equipment sales and service, as well as um, wholesale coffee and such. Um, wholesale is our largest profit center. Uh, we have multiple distributors, Northeast Coffee Company, Cisco, Central Distributors. We're in over 300 locations currently throughout Maine, including 27 Hanfords. Um, we have one of the largest cold brew uh, coffee distribution in Maine in partnership with Gagan's Brewery out of Bangor. They brew thousand gallon batches of our cold brew coffee and they keg it and it's distributed by Valley and Maine distributors all over the state. Uh, really the biggest uh, trends in the coffee industry in 2022 included nitro cold brew coffee and ready to drink coffee in cans. 
Last year, the ready to drink category earned $1.6 billion. And building off of our expertise with keg coffee, two years ago, we finally partnered with a co-packer and launched our first two ready to drink cans of coffee. Uh, we have a maple latte and then a nitro with cream and sugar. Uh, proving our success, Central Distributors, which is out of Lewiston, has added our retail bags of coffee and all of our ready to drink flavors of canned coffee into their portfolio. Central Distributors is so critical for a company like us because they distribute to over 2,000 locations from Fort Kent all the way to Kittery. A lot of beverage distributors besides Central are like, you have to have multiples and fit across the state to get across the entire state to reach that. Uh, the last few months have been kind of taking over our original Hannaford's, getting us into new locations. We just launched into 23 Freshies convenience stores, um, as well as um, a lot of other C-store locations, convenience store locations. Um, the Freshies was really looking for a main company that had an, a ready-to-drink product uh, that to add value to it to their national brand line. They didn't want another national brand in when they were adding in. Two types of collaborations, uh, examples that we have is recently with the University of Maine. In March, they selected Coffee Hound as the official coffee of the Maine Black Bears. So we're so excited to work with them on that. We launched a co-branded Maine Black Bears Nitro Caramel and Cream Coffee. And as a licensed brand, we can distribute that throughout the state with Central's distributors into any location. So Freshies is currently carrying that. We're getting into Dice Arts. A lot of other places are going to be popping up. Um, springing off of that, in addition, uh, we're now working with the Dempsey Foundation to work with them creating also their own co-branded ready-to-drink product uh, to raise funds for their foundation. So we really try to find novel ways to collaborate with a lot of different organizations around coffee. You're going to start seeing our brand moving into new territories we really haven't been in before. And so what I'm kind of looking for is brand ambassadors kind of to spread the word about Coffee Hound. Um, and possibly new collaborations. Thank you guys so much for today. Thanks, Jen. And I don't know if you saw in the chat, but um, Joan, uh, you, you have a customer, customer testimonial uh, uh, saying how good the cold brew is. <laughs> um, any, any questions? What's the best email for you, Jen? I'll put it in the chat here. So. Perfect. Uh, it's jen at coffeehoundcoffeeco.com, but I'll write it out for you. You had mentioned, um, you know, going through Scratchpad and also through Topka, and I guess I'd love to hear a little bit about what you found, you know, in terms of the business growth and scaling, you know, were there any things in particular that were really impactful for, for you, you know, participating in those sorts of programs? Oh, they're also different. So Top Gun was the first one and we started in the cafe world and a lot of small businesses like restaurants don't go through entrepreneurial classes like that. So we hadn't really done that until we started doing it in manufacturing. COVID hit. We did a lot of pivoting, a lot of changing. Um, it was really crucial to us being able to regain where we were in 2019 with all new profit centers in three years. Three years we did that. So I'm really proud to have been part of that, which is why it was kind of so exciting for us to be part of, you know, being a mentor to go back with that. Uh, the main, uh, the food and beverage accelerator course is very different, goes a much deeper dive at that point. Scratchpad has been phenomenal as well. I mean, that's what the Upstart program, obviously, and went through that this year. And they're very different in what kind of level you're at to participate in them. With Scratchpad, I needed a new um, marketing branding person immediately for our can designs. Um, we were trying to go toe to toe with national brands and immediately they paired me up with a phenomenal graphic designer who does a lot of beer companies like Bissell Brothers and all of those. So it really helped us to like get amazing, um, you know, new graphics for our bags and all of that. So our new bags are coming out in August. Um, so it's really helped us in different ways, but you really have to understand how to work the programs as well to get the maximum value out of it and kind of going through and learning one to then build off of it and understand, hey, by, you know, third program, I know, hey, I need this or how do I get that or where is this? <laughs> so it really becomes a great resource. It's so hard to meet entrepreneurs where they are sometimes if they don't know about you, but once they find you, we love you. <laughs> so. That's great. And, and maybe if um, anybody here has companies who are who are considering participating in one of those programs, uh, would it be okay to kind of introduce them to you so you can kind of share yeah. your experience with them? Of course. That would be great. Any, um, maybe time for like one last question if anybody has one. 
I'll bite. So Jen, thank you. I know you've been giving back as a MCE mentor and you've got a strong background in nonprofits and done a lot. You mentioned briefly something about the it's not a franchise, but it's a, a license or something. Could you tell us more about that, how you're setting up cafes? Sure. So we do it as a license program, which means we don't tell them how to do the POS. We don't tell them what kind of food to serve. So once you get into those details, it becomes more like a franchise. So they're licensed to be able to use our name, access our all of our logos, designs, things of that nature, um, access our social media, our marketing um, access all of our recipes, um, trainings. We train on site. We're the only formal barista training in the state of Maine where we go on site and train baristas either at our licensed cafes or we've worked with another probably over 50 cafes where we go in every year, help train their staff. Um, we've done over 200 baristas with that training course. And so it's really become, we love to kind of work with new cafes as well. So if there's anybody out there that knows a cafe, um, we love helping people figure out not having to reinvent the wheel, you know, and, and helping them either, whether it's a licensed location that comes with all of that, or whether it's a consulting kind of thing of, hey, here's what your building's going to look like. How do you do this? How do you create a menu? you know, all of that kind of stuff. Equipment we sell, we're um, a licensed dealer and licensed technician. So in Maine, there's only three licensed technicians for espresso machines. So it's kind of important when you're having coffee to be, you know, fully packaged. So we talk about that one-stop shop for cafes with that, but. And is that particularly strategic or is that going to be where the revenue growth ultimately lies? Um, not necessarily. We do get the best profit center out of our wholesale coffee direct to cafes. Our cafe at in Bar Harbor, they go through 200 pounds of coffee a week versus uh, one of our distributors who might use that much for 30 locations at a retail store. So really it kind of diversifies us. And I know it's kind of like, oh, you only want to have two or three of these things. We're very multi right now, pulling in resources from lots of different areas. We do get a percentage off of sales from um, our license locations. So I love that revenue. And those are great things to talk about to business owners that, hey, the sooner you can let go, create that kind of thing, it brings in money, allows you to focus on other areas. We would never have gotten into manufacturing as deep as we had had we still been running cafes in one degree. So. Although we are looking to kind of branch out. We're trying to start a line of coffee carts as well. And we're looking to try to put those in hospitals. So keep an eye out for that. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks so much, Jen. Uh, it's, yeah, I, I, it's amazing to hear your kind of story and, and how much you've managed to grow over the past decade or so. So congrats. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate being here today. And stay cool. So, <laughs> yes. Yeah, it is. It is warm out. We have maybe a few. Well, we can take a go a little over noon, but um, any kind of community announcements, any programs or, you know, just things to share with the group that folks want to put on folks radar. Tom, is there any chance you would talk more about the prime in that scoring rubric that went by pretty quick, but. Uh, I can, I mean, so I uh, candidly, that's the only information I have, but I can repeat it um, just to make sure that folks caught it. And I, again, I'll put this in the notes, but um, again, so um, these, uh, this is going to launch in July um, prime. It's up to $7 million total that our MTI is going to be putting out as a competitive process. So you'll be scored against other applicants. Um, and the decision is planned to be made in September. So th that's kind of the macro picture in terms of, so it's a competitive process in terms of how applications are going to be scored. It, you know, it's 40 points available total. Um, 10 points are on the quality and amount of matching funds. So for any MTI request, you're, you're required to show matching funds. So, you know, what is the nature of that matching funds and how much are you bringing to your request? So that's 10 points, 10 points for depth and quality of the leadership team. Um, so, and again, you, you could be scored anywhere from one to 10 on each of these. Uh, 20 points if new to MTI. I'm not sure, candidly, if that's just, if you're new to MTI, you instantly get 20 points or if there's some array there. But uh, I mean, definitely looking for companies who haven't been able to avail of MTI resources in the past. Um, and then 20 points available if uh, the company is located in rural Maine. And I think by rural Maine, we mean kind of underserved regions of Maine that MTI historically hasn't served. So typically a lot of MTI funding goes to the metro, you know, the Portland and the Bangor areas. So I would imagine if you're outside of that region, that, that would qualify. 
um, and or led by an underserved founding team. So, you know, female founders, people of color, um, veterans, uh, you know, th those sorts of groups who are historically underserved uh, would also uh, be something that MTI is seeking to, um, to emphasize. Um, but I'm sure MTI will have a full announcement go out and hopefully by MXG next meeting, I can share more concrete details, but, you know, keep an eye out for MTI newsletter. I'm sure we'll put out a press release and the like, um, but definitely, you know, please spread the word to companies who might be eligible. There's not, so MT, MTI normally has a, an innovation criteria um, for our core funding. I don't believe that that's the case for this request. So it's a good way for companies who might not be typically eligible for MTI funding to, to be able to um, get some funds. Any other any other group announcements? Do you know what you're going to be calling that grant if we're looking for it? I think it'll be called Prime Two, Prime Phase Two. So we had a Prime Phase One a couple of years ago, and I think it's going to be uh, named Prime Phase Two. Any other? Um, any other? Yes. Yes. One, one quick question on that. Um, sure. um, for that grant, is are there any specific stipulations as to how that money can be used? Are there specific requirements around it? Another excellent question. I don't believe so. I think, I mean, I think it's based on the proposed project's plan to achieve stability and foster company growth. So I think as long as you're able to demonstrate that it's a project that's going to, you know, have a meaningful impact on your business continuing to scale. I'm not aware of any other stipulations. Um, but again, you know, that, I, that might change. So definitely, you know, kind of keep an eye out for, for when the proposal comes out. And like I said, I think that'll be mid July when we actually publish the details of what that entails. But I think I think there should be a lot of flexibility as long as you're able to demonstrate it's going to be impactful and allowing the business to scale. Thank you. More more coffee would have a meaningful impact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Agreed. Yeah, I could go for a cold brew right now. Well on that note, I hope everybody gets a chance to get somewhere cool today. Uh, or maybe maybe go to Gritty's and, and hang out with Ken and Co. Uh, and yeah, thank you to all our presenters. Thanks for everybody for attending. Um, we will have another virtual meeting in July and then August, uh, we're gonna be off. Um, but hopefully see you all next, uh, next month. Take care all. Great, thanks everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye Tom.